Buju, welcome. My name's Elizabeth Pigeon. I'm a member of the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe, and I'm Eagle Clan. And it's an honor to be invited today to come and um, open with a prayer. It honors both myself and my family, my clan, and my nation. For all our blessings. For all that you provide us and all of those great teachings that you have brought us. Our Mother Earth, we apologize for all of the wrongs that we do and all of the pollution that we create as human beings. Please forgive us and continue to nurture us and bless us with a good life. Chimigwich Chipumama, creator of all things, Kijemnado. Chimigwich for these beautiful teachings that you provide us through our family through our clan, and through our nation. Please bless all of those who are in attendance here and let them get home safely after this wonderful evening. Please open our hearts so that as we hear things, adversities, things that may make us feel some of those emotions, thank you for giving us the emotional strength to deal with those adversities. As we come together here as a people, as one nation, as a community. We are grateful for all that you provide, and we are grateful for all those blessings that we have received and that we will continue to receive. Chimigwich for the mental knowledge, the physical growth, the emotional strength, and the spiritual wisdom to handle the adversities of our daily life. And we thank you. We say Chimigwich for all our blessings, and for all of you here today. Miigwech. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to have you all here today. Thank you for making the time. And thank you, Elizabeth for this beautiful prayer from uh, Michigan's native community. We appreciate you being here and for helping us make space for Crystal's voice today. Elizabeth Pigeon, who was up here, and as she said, she's from the Saginaw Chippewa tribe. Elizabeth has worked with many tribes uh, throughout Michigan in a variety of roles and is currently the vice chair of her tribe's uh, powwow committee. So welcome to this uh, wonderful 20th uh, annual Weggy Foundation Speaker Series. We're very, very pleased to have all of you here today and to continue to have the Speaker Series here at Aquinas College. This is our 20th year, and we feel so privileged to be able to do this. I would like to acknowledge the Weggy family and board of trustees of the Weggy Foundation. They are here today. And we're pleased. I think uh, they might not all be right here in this facility today, but I know in town there are, um, I think, representatives from four generations of Weggies. So thank you for being with us, and thank you for all that you do. Let's <laughs> So today's event is titled, The Real Cost of Oil, The Case for Justice at the Ends, at the Ends of the Pipeline. And uh, this uh, Weggy Speaker Series is just one of the ways that we honor uh, the uh, legacy of Peter M. Weggy, who we all know and adore. It helps us to continue the dialogue around economicology, which is a term that he coined many years ago to denote the connection between the environment and the economic issues that we have. Here at Aquinas, uh, we have been very privileged to be able to benefit from uh, Peter's uh, thinking, his work, his philanthropy, and certainly giving us a lot of opportunity to create things here at Aquinas for our students, 
but also for the community. Aquinas launched the first sustainable business undergraduate program of its kind in the United States back in 2003, and it continues to be a strong program here. We also have a very strong Center for Sustainability, which focuses on environmental restoration, community relationships, and financial stability. We also have been very privileged to work on curriculum. We are building out the concept of economicology, and uh, we hope to have that integrated into our curriculum over time. I am also very pleased uh, to say that our faculty in the sciences have been very busy working on the, their vision for 21st century science education here at Aquinas. And part of that is to ex expand our environmental studies program and to make it uh, stronger and robust and also within the 21st century realm. I'm also very pleased that Aquinas uh, we will be bringing on a Dean of Science and Sustainability, thanks to the Wege Foundation. And this position, um, we have selected a person. She is finishing out her contract at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, but she will be joining us in June, and we are very, very pleased that she will be coming to lead our initiatives in this 21st century science vision. Uh, over the coming years, and so we're very, very excited. And once again, thank you to the Wege Foundation for making that possible. So next I'd like to introduce someone who is also very passionate for uh, Peter's vision of uh, environmental justice, and that is one of Peter's granddaughters, Caitlin Wege. Caitlin lives in, um, uh, in, in, in Saint, in, Somebody told me I could not make a mistake on this word and because it's a Spanish word. And as soon as I saw it, I went, what is that? What is that? <clears throat> Encinitas, Encinitas, California. Uh, she's a trustee and on the grants committee of the Wege Foundation. She's also a um, board member and board chair of the One to One Movement and uh, which is an environmental education organization located in California. Caitlin is a partner in Moodoo's Limited Partnership and uh, also um, an investment fund based in um, Arizona. So without further ado, uh, Caitlin will introduce our speaker. So let's welcome Caitlin to the podium. Encinitas. <laughs> you said it so beautifully. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> As Michiganders, we know that the Great Lakes make up the largest body of fresh water on Earth. They account for one fifth of the fresh water on the surface of the planet. That's roughly six quadrillion gallons. But are we aware of the risks posed by refining? oil and gas and transporting it through these lakes and across our state? Some recent examples of these risks. In 2010, an Enbridge pipeline in southern Michigan ruptured, spilling approximately one million gallons of tar sands crude oil into the Kalamazoo River. It was the largest inland oil spill in US history, contaminating nearly 40 miles of river. The cost to clean it up, a billion dollars. Four years later, in 2014, BP spent over four billion to overhaul its refinery near Chicago. This overhaul was specifically to process Alberta tar sands crude oil. Within only weeks of starting up, this plant malfunctioned, spilling crude oil into Lake Michigan. And after all this, one would hope that things would improve, but only two weeks ago, Enbridge was back in the news again. The University of Michigan re released a startling report. They demonstrated a catastrophic impacts that would result from a break in Enbridge's 62-year-old oil pipelines, and these run underwater across the Straits of Mackinac. Our society has an addiction to fossil fuels, and we see the environmental implications 
but too often we don't see the social implications. When my grandfather, Peter Wege, published his books on econometrology, he called for a society based on six E's. Environment, economy, ecology, education, empathy, and ethics. This afternoon, our speaker will focus on the last two concepts, empathy and ethics. She is a member of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation in Alberta, Canada. She serves her nation in several roles as treaty coordinator, oh, wait, yep. <laughs> Treaty Coordinator and Communications Manager of the Intergovernmental Affairs and Industry Relations. <laughs> the, indi the indigenous people of her homeland built their lives on a beautiful area of the Albertan forest. And we're not talking about 100 acres. We're talking about the area the size of Switzerland. In 2008, the pollution and fragmentation from more than 19,000 fossil fuel projects in their territory threatened to destroy their way of life. The Beaver, Creek, the Beaver Lake Cree Nation sued the Canadian government, claiming that they violated a century-old treaty that gives them the legal rights to hunt, fish, and trap on this beautiful land. With both her academic background and her indigenous knowledge, she brings global attention to the devastating impacts of the largest industrial project in the world. Let me repeat that. The Alberta Tar Sands Development is the largest industrial project in the world, and it's on their land. Last December in Paris, she joined a collective of indigenous people from around the world to bring their voice to the international stage at the climate negotiations. Three months earlier, I had the pleasure of meeting her when she was a keynote speaker at the Retreat for the Environmental Grant Making Association. And most recently, she was featured in Naomi Klein's film about climate change. And if you haven't seen the film titled, This Changes Everything, it's not to be missed. Nor is our speaker right now. So please join me in welcoming, as the 20th annual Weggy Lecturer, the very inspiring Crystal Lehman. Miasen, when I beat the geese ago, what's a squat to me? Beat the way, go squat to me, we we. Crystal Lehman, see us on. I'm just saying, I'm going to help you out. I'm just going to help you out. I'm just going to help you out. Good afternoon from the doorway in to the doorway out. My name is Crystal Lehman, and I'm a member of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation Treaty Number no. Six. Um, first and foremost, I want to. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge um, the territory of the original people that were, were on the Anishinaabek, um, what is now known as uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. I want to also give thanks to the Wege Foundation, the Wege family uh, more specifically, um, and um, I want to give thanks to the organizers as well and to the college for welcoming me. Um, I had a pretty tough week, um, and I forgot to push start on my timer. So all that doesn't count. <laughs> um, um, it, it, it's been a tough week. Uh, this, this past week, I, I arrived in Michigan on Monday, and it's very seldom that I go into a territory and I'm given the opportunity to make a connection with the frontline communities. Um, it's very seldom that I'm being given the opportunity to um, put my feet um, on Ogawi Mao, a ski mother earth, um, and, and to touch um, Nipipamatsuin, the water of life. And I was given that opportunity um, yesterday. I, I, I stopped in Battle Creek and, and visited um, the folks there. I also visited um, 
the most polluted zip code in Michigan. And it was really hurtful to be there and um, to hear the stories and the realities of those people there um, who told the exact same realities of those of us on the front lines of, of the Alberta tar sands. Um, the smell was even the same. Um, and so being here today, now, and, and after FaceTiming with my children last night, I'm having a hard time balancing myself right now. Um, so as, as good as it was to visit, it also was, um, it, it's had a huge effect on how balanced I feel, or imbalanced, rather. Um, so the last remaining forests and planets, biodiversity, and rivers, and lakes, and streams are in Indigenous peoples' territories. But rampant large-scale development projects without regard to the environment and the Indigenous peoples inhabiting these areas is becoming too much to ignore. In order to address climate change, fight deforestation, and achieve sustainable development goals, there is an urgent need to recognize the collective land rights of Indigenous peoples. And that needs to happen by everyone. Indigenous peoples have been sustainably managing natural resources through customary laws and sustainable resource management practices for thousands and thousands of years. The protection and promotion of these traditional systems are crucial in the fight against climate change, deforestation, and water pollution. Our lands and our waters are being taken without our free prior and informed consent. In dealing with climate change, recognizing that 37% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions are coming out of the Alberta, out of the province of Alberta, 37% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. 22% of that is coming out of the Alberta tar sands. And if there's any one person that thinks climate change doesn't affect them and tar sands doesn't affect them, remind yourself that 22% of those emissions are coming from my homelands. The colonial governments of Alberta and Canada have failed to protect the Indigenous peoples' rights or uphold the constitutionally protected inherent treaty inherent in treaty and recognized Aboriginal rights of our nations and members. And Alberta's land use framework and regulatory approvals process undermines the treaty relationship between the nations and Alberta. This is contributing to the erosion of the necessary foundations for the nations to continue to exercise treaty rights in perpetuity, forever, as guaranteed through treaty. The historical relationship between the government and our nations has been severely damaged and requires aggressive solutions to address outstanding issues regarding current legislation and policies put in place by the previous government that do not support reconciliation between the nations and the Crown. And this includes moving away from the systems of manufactured consent that have been created outside of our communities. And I was recently reminded by Danica Littlechild, an Indigenous lawyer, from a neighboring First Nation of the Supreme Court ruling that the provinces have an obligation to uphold treaty as well. A provincial and federal climate change policy in line with internationally recognized standards under the UN Declaration will provide benefits to everyone. Article 32 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People states that Indigenous peoples have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands, territories, and resources. As an Indigenous woman, I was raised by my aunties and my uncles. I was lucky enough to be raised by old people. I was lucky enough to be brought up by my grandma. And I was raised with the understanding that Ogawi Mao Aski, 
Mother Earth is our grocery store. Reminded constantly that every single thing a human being needs to survive is right there on that land. Yet here we are, feeding an addiction to oil, resource extraction, economics, and development. And that's not to say that economics is a bad thing. But what I am saying is that this current system of economics is a bad thing, where it's creating economic hostages. So, for those that don't know, there are three tar sands deposits in Alberta. The Peace River deposit area, the Athabasca deposit area, I guess I could use this, and the Cold Lake deposit area. Also within the province of Alberta lies three of the 11 numbered treaties in Canada. Treaty 8, Treaty 6, where I'm from, and Treaty 7. Um, Treaty 7 is where all of the uh, fracking of natural gas happens. We also have some fracking of natural gas in Treaty 8 as well. Another um, thing that a lot of people don't know is that of the 100% of Alberta tar sands, only 20% can actually be extracted using um, the open pit mining, and that's in this area in, in Treaty 8. And so those, you know, when you see the images of the big trucks and, and the mining areas, that is the open pit mining. The other process that's being used is a process called in situ, or SAGD, so steam-assisted gravity drainage. Um, so the other 80% of, of those deposit areas needs to be, um, the bitumen needs to be extracted using this process because it's too deep to mine, to surface mine. This is tar sands. This is the bottom of the barrel, literally. This is what everyone is fighting about. Tar sands Bitumen is a mixture of clay, sand, water, and oil. This used to be pristine boreal forest. There is nothing on this planet that compares with the destruction going on there. If there were a global prize for unsustainable development, the tar sands would be the clear winner. And that came from Dr. David Schindler, an ecology professor at the University of Alberta. Overburden, an industry and government term. Since operations began, tar sands extractors have moved more than 1.4 billion tons of what industry calls overburden, which is actually pristine boreal forest, which is actually my home, my children's home which is actually medicines that we rely on. This is more dirt than was moved for the Great Wall of China, the Suez Canal, the Great Pyramid of Cheops, and the 10 largest dams in the world combined. Overburden. Displacing my people from our homes, displacing air beings, land beings, water beings, in the name of resource extraction. But we're here. We're still here, and we're not going anywhere. And so this is the Beaver Lake Cree Nation traditional territory that black line is, is the Alberta and Saskatchewan border. So, um, our traditional territory actually goes into Saskatchewan Treaty 6, goes well into Saskatchewan. 
The Beaver Lake Cree's traditional territory spans 38,972 square kilometers, and I promised myself to put that in miles, and I didn't convert it. I'm sorry. Um, so 38,972 square kilometers. 34,773 square kilometers of that is oil and gas well sites. Oil and gas well sites in place where a government has failed in, do, in their due process, in their duty to consult with the local First Nations. They failed in their duty to consult and achieve minimum standards of free prior and informed consent of nations like the Beaver Lake Cree. And as you can see, oh, wrong one. As you can see, every square kilometer of those two deposit areas that fall within the Beaver Lake Cree's traditional territory has been leased out to every major oil company in the world. The process that's used in my traditional territory is a process called SAGD. Um, there's also another process called CSS that I'll get to later. Um, one fact that a lot of people don't know is that SAGD actually leaves a larger environmental footprint um, than open pit mining. A typical project occupies a 25 square kilometer, again, I didn't put it in miles, um, occupies a 25 square kilometer area and directly destroys 7% of the land. But the technology supporting roads, pipelines, and seismic lines industrialized the forest so completely that it makes, it, makes the land in, inhospitable for much wildlife. 2008 report by the industry and government funded SEMA, which is the Cumulative Environmental Management Association, disclosed that SAG-D, as currently designed, would extirpate caribou, fish, bear, and moose over a region 400,000 hectares in size. These are pictures further um, of the seismic lines, the well pad sites, the breaking up of our traditional lands. Um, so another part of the tar sands is this very sick cycle of industry. So what happens is um, the logging industry comes in and removes the overburden. Um, so deforestation and clear cutting within our traditional territory. And they create the um, drawing page for um, the natural gas extraction. We have a lot of that as well. Um, and then the, the tar sands. So what happens is the natural gas that's being extracted, and fracked gas as well, um, outside of our territory. So they're taking the natural gas which anybody who knows anything about fracking um, and knows anything about extracting natural gas, it's, um, it uses a lot of very dangerous chemicals. Um, fracking is very similar to SAG-D. And so what, what happens is after they've extracted the natural gas, they then use the natural gas to heat the bitumen, um, to heat the water, that the steam inject into the ground through one pipe full of chemicals. They're using natural gas to heat that water, which is pumped with more chemicals. That then melts the bitumen that they then transport up another tube. So steam in, bitumen out. And so here we are now in the state of Michigan where Enbridge is saying, but it's a thicker pipe. It's safer. Majority of the pipes in Alberta are fairly new. Pipelines leak. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The tar sands and the industrialization in our territory 
is causing um, major migratory pattern disruptions of our caribou, our moose, our bison, our songbirds, our waterfowl, our fish. And it's also contaminating food, food that we depend on and rely on. As much as I can stand here wearing lipstick and wearing Spanx, um, oil products. That's not what this is about, though. This is about those beings that cannot speak for themselves and feeding our addiction to oil. So in 2006, Suncor found that arsenic levels were 453 times higher in moose. The Alberta government studied arsenic as well, and they concluded that all wild meat may have unacceptably high levels of cancer-causing toxins. Not may, it does, and we know this because our food's making us sick. We have higher levels of respiratory illnesses, cancers. In 2007, an independent consultant found high levels of arsenic in the waters, fish contaminated with higher levels of mercury, and levels of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons considered unsafe to aquatic life. Contaminants were not only found in fish, but also in waterfowl, muskrat, beavers, and moose, all of which are traditional food sources for my community. Oh, in case you missed it, those are tumors. Those are tumors that are found on fish. Um, so here's a glimpse into the trials and tribulations that we're facing. A people challenged by the strong arm of industry and their willful ignorance that follows. So on May 20th of 2013, two oil spills were reported on the Canadian Natural Resources Limited lease pads that were located on the Cold Lake Air Weapons Range in Northern Alberta. Two more reports followed on June 8th and June 24th. Three of the spills were found on land and the fourth was found under a lake. A lake that had to have portions of it drained. A lake that, in the southern portion that they drained, we have affidavits of our elders saying that we have ancestors buried in the southwest portion of that lake. These spills have killed over 200 birds, small animals, and amphibians. Over 1.5 million liters of bitumen emulsion seeped to the surface and contaminated groundwater that we all depend on, if we want to talk about fresh water. Um, so if we don't deal with this current system of economic development, we're going to end up going down a path that has no reverse. We need to return to the foundation of those historical treaties, the ones that were based on relationships and sustainability. One thing to recognize about those four underground spills is those were not pipeline spills. What happened was they're using a process on the Cold Lake Air Weapons testing range, an active military testing range, where they're dropping bombs and whatever else they're dropping there. They're using a process called cyclic steam simulation, which is very similar to SAG-D. This process actually came out of an accident that happened in Venezuela by Shell, where they pumped so much steam into the ground that it caused a volcanic eruption. And instead of them saying, whoa, wait, that's probably not a good idea, we probably shouldn't do that, they said, hey, that's a quicker way to get the oil out of the ground. Let's turn that into a process. This process is so dangerous that it requires seismic monitoring of the ground, and yet they moved it onto an active military testing range. And so what happened is they pumped so much steam into the ground that it created explosions. 
So what happens to a balloon when you blow it and you blow it and you blow it and you blow it? It, it explodes, it pops. That's what happened. One exploded, it created a fissure in the ground, so the ground opened up. Another one exploded, another one, and another one. To date, there has been no conclusion on whether or not those spills have stopped. What they said was, we have to let Mother Nature run its course. I want you to think about that and think about what would happen if an explosion like that happened underneath Lake Michigan. You gonna drain Lake Michigan? Probably not. Um, I didn't come here to sell you anything, um, but I did come here to tell you the truth. To speak the truth. Um, and the truth is, is that people are dying. And I know that they're dying on this end of the pipeline as well. Um, water life, land life, air life is dying in the name of extreme resource extraction. Um, so, giving a nod to Rachel. Where are you, Rachel? Rachel Hood. Is she here? Oh, oh there you are. <laughs> um, so, in talking about you know, your work with the water, um, and, and Caitlin as well, you know, you're going to give life again. Um, I felt it was really important to talk about this. So, as a woman, the way I was raised by our old people, um, especially by my grandmas, um, is that as women, we have a responsibility to the water. That's our gift. That's our responsibility, is the water. Nipipamatsuin, water of life. And it's our responsibility to protect that. So without you even knowing why you had this connection, that's why. So reclamation, reclaiming um, your responsibility as a woman. It's not by chance that we carry life in water. It's not by chance that that first, that first uh, welcoming when we give life is water. It's the same thing with our Mother Earth. Nipipamatsuin, the milk of our mother. That's the one thing that connects each and every one of us. Doesn't matter race, color, or creed, water. And as women, it's our responsibility to protect that. And so I go every once in a while and I sit at our lake and I reflect and I put an offering in the water and I try to do that. And I try to do that as a reminder about why I'm doing what I'm doing and why I have to leave my children so much. As a single mom, that's not easy to leave my children. But they understand too. And I'm really grateful that my children love me that much, that they understand why I do what I do and they understand that it, it's about them. But I was sitting there, and I looked down at my feet, and I said, oh my God, where your feet are crystal, I'm only 34, I'm still young, really young, really, really young. <laughs> um, <laughs> I looked down at my feet, and I said, where your feet are is where the water line was when you were a child. Where is the water going? That same year, I took my son for his birthday because I keep them away from marches and protests and those types of things. I took them to the Healing Walk, which is one of the things that, that I organized. I helped organize um, prayer for the tar sands. And, and we do a walk in the Alberta tar sands once a year. Um, we're done now, but this is, I think this was year four, and we stopped at year five. Um, and just before this picture was taken, 
my son got a bleeding nose. He got sick. My niece had an asthma attack. And then I was reminded that just up the road from there is a First Nations community. What you see there behind me is the Sahara Desert in what was once pristine boreal forest. Every single thing a human being needs to survive was right there. That cannot be reclaimed. Nothing will ever grow there again. Reminding you again that the devastation is the size of the state of Florida. Reclamation is one thing that um, industry and government really tries to sell to people, but we're reclaiming it. We're giving it back to them. Giving back what? Something that you never had the right in the first place to take. Tell them I said hi. <laughs> um, so current models of reclamation are not adequate and are not proven to put the land back to the way that it was. So regardless of advancements in reclamation practices, reclamation cannot and does not mitigate impacts to our treaty rights. And it will take generations before the lands will be even remotely close to the way that it was. And in these generations, our ways of knowing and being will be lost. And so here we are, drinking bottled water, airlifting our babies, to the hospitals for drinking contaminated water. And, and though, you know, we are lucky in Beaver Lake to, to have, you know, to be able to turn on our tap and drink our water, there are nations that cannot do that. There are nations that cannot bathe their babies in the water. There are nations that have to time their showers. Cancer rates and respiratory illnesses are on the rise. We have boil water advisories, moose with pus bubbles under the skin, deer with green meat, fish with tumors and cancers hanging off of them. And then the reminder of that fear, that fear that I have that the stories of our old people skimming the top of the water, taking their dipper from their backpack and drinking that water it's going to become just that, stories. Stories that my children and our future generations can only hear of and never experience. But we have First Nations rights under treaty. So First Nations rights enshrined as Aboriginal rights in Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982 are arguably some of the most important emerging rights on the Canadian legal landscape, and certainly the most powerful environmental rights in the country. Thus, when these mega projects are destroying the First Nations rights to hunt, trap, and fish, which are in direct violation of our constitutional rights, the highest law in Canada, then there's grounds to challenge. They made their law. They made their law, they have to abide by it. Us as Indigenous people, we abide by natural law. So they don't get to pick the pieces of their law they like and which ones they don't. We can no longer be economic hostages while this system continues to covet our air and our water. A system playing environmental roulette with our lives, because there's one thing about that game, someone always loses. And right now, our children are losing. Those next seven generations are losing. Um, I wanted to share this quote from Art Manuel's book, Unsettling Canada. If you haven't read that book, you should. I know you're like, what, that has nothing to do with us? It does. Um, so if you haven't read it, read it. Um, I watched as he, Chief Quetzinas, worked with the outside environmentalists to build a campaign to save the forest with road blockades and a boycott of great rainforest timber. Chief Quetzinas was one of the first arrested and he spoke for himself in front of the judge. I am charged with contempt of court, he told the judge. Yet there is continuous contempt of our culture, our heritage, our lands, and our rights. Logging companies coming to our land without our consent show contempt of our laws, our land, our people. The Beaver Lake Cree Nation, as an example, 
is currently engaged in a landmark constitutional treaty rights challenge, a challenge that has named tens of thousands of treaty rights violations of Treaty 6 by the province of Alberta, the government of Canada, and every major oil company in the world operating in the controversial Canadian tar sands. And the Beaver Lake Cree Nation's case represents a growing understanding that through Aboriginal title and inherent in treaty rights, Indigenous rights as the last stronghold is the strongest legally binding strategy to stop the expansion of the tar sands at the source, including all of the associated pipeline infrastructure coming out of Alberta to bring this landlocked resource to international markets. And with that, I'm gonna play a three minute video um, of folks in my community. I'm just gonna like briefly say that the man that you'll hear speak um, in the red plaid shirt is my uncle Al. He was the chief in my community for 35 years, one of the longest standing chiefs in Alberta. Um, he's the one who launched litigation for us in 2008 under his leadership. Um, and the woman talking about the medicine and, and it, the land being our church is now currently leading the Beaver Lake Cree Nation as our chief. Um, so I just wanted to say that much before we push play on the video. Yeah, this is an old well. This is the first well that they punched in the reserve here. When they punched it through, that trembled and shook, shook everything. My community is located in the middle of two of the three tar sands deposits. Every square kilometer in those deposits that fall within our traditional hunting territory have been leased out to industry without um, the Canadian government uh, following through with their duty to consult with the Beaver Lake Cree. Um, we called this the island because it was surrounded by water. All the water used to be here? Yeah, it used to be like right where the trees start. That was all water. It was swamped and then the rest was lake. There's no water. I know when I was a child, you could take a cup, you could take a container and drink the water just right behind me. That's, that's no longer possible. We were the first environmentalists. We were the first scientists. When you take age especially, you don't take the root. You leave the root in. Because it regrows from the root. Like when you pull the root, you're pulling the whole plant. This is your whole church. That's what I was told my Belinda. Like this whole world is over. When we pray, we say in a nice one. That means we're thankful, we're grateful. As we float down the river of life, we have this piece of board that we hang on to. And that's what's keeping us afloat, heart beating. And that water, we call that the milk of the earth. We're airlifting our babies to the local hospitals for drinking contaminated water. We're not going to have anywhere to run away to because we are from here. We are from this land. Indigenous rights, treaty rights, are the last stronghold that we have. As of March 28th of 2012, the Beaver Lake Cree set historical precedents and have been the first community to ever be granted a trial in relation to uh, petroleum industry in traditional hunting territory. The provincial and the federal government has tried every trick in the book um, to have this case thrown out. It had to happen. I mean, somebody had to stand up and say, whoa. And in our situation, it's, it's the small guy that gets to do that. The only thing that's going to stop us from winning this lawsuit is money. And so here, the nation's poorest people are carrying one of the most historically precedent-setting litigations on their back. 
and it's up to the nation to get behind our people and support that. So based on that treaty, um, this was the foundation of our lawsuit. Uh, so where there is a treaty or Aboriginal right, governments cannot destroy the meaningful opportunity to exercise the right. For a right to hunt, fish, or gather plant or medicine resources to be meaningful, there must remain a harvestable surplus of the species being collected. To have a harvestable surplus, there must be a healthy, productive wild population and to have a healthy wild population, there must be sufficient productive habitat to support that population. So in other words, there must be a healthy natural environment. And if the natural environment is degraded by industrial activity, and the populations are stressed and put into crisis by industry, and if there is no longer a population of species healthy enough to support the right, then there has been an infringement of the right. And the Beaver Lake Cree, under the leadership of my uncle Al, um, said that I'm not going to just take each company to court. I'm going to take everyone to court. And that's what he did. And we were granted a trial. We're the first community to ever be granted a trial based on the cumulative effects of the industry within our traditional hunting territory. Um, and at the same time, you know, I just want to say that this is not about us versus them. This is not about pitting um, ourselves against each other. This is not about saying no to revenue and economic development. My uncle Ron, who um, is also another really amazing man, he helped write the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, said that we want the non-Indigenous people, the developers, to prove to us that there is such a thing as sustainable development. And the only way that is going to happen is if the Indigenous people are consulted and given all of the information before any development takes place. First Nations rights, the last remaining stronghold to environmental protection. Um, I literally have like maybe five more minutes if you guys can just hold on. <laughs> I timed myself and I still went over and I tend to do that. I was raised by my grandma so I always like to tell stories and I need to not do that. <laughs> um, so here's a quote from one of my relatives, Melina Lubbockan Massimo. Um, she's from the Little Buffalo um, in the, the Peace River. So after campaigning on resource extraction for the last decade or so, and really seeing the problems that we're dealing with, but not seeing really any tangible solutions we can implement in our communities, I thought, why aren't we using solar as a solution to resource extraction and climate change, but also producing local energy? Molina's community, um, the Little Buffalo, located in the heart of the Peace River, um, Tar Sands area, was victim to a massive pipeline spill in the spring of 2011, um, when 28,000 barrels of oil leaked from a rupture in Plains Midstream's uh, Rainbow Pipeline system just 10 kilometers from the community. Um, that pipeline spill was larger than the Kalamazoo. Um, we have communities installing solar and exercising their right to economic sovereignty. Um, they installed an 80 kilowatt um, solar system in their community just last summer. Um, so we have communities exercising um, their right to economic sovereignty. Um, and this is one example. And the Beaver Lake Cree Nation is actually another example. Um, so we're currently fundraising for a self-sustaining elders lodge that will house our elders, create solar energy for the grid, and address the chronic housing shortage in our community. So viable solutions are necessary. They're necessary and they're urgent. We don't desire a low carbon economy led by renewable energy. We need a low carbon economy led by renewable energy. We need to be looking at sustainable solutions that drive economic development, will protect our species at risk, will protect those that are not, and above all, will put the rights of Ogawi Maweski, Mother Earth first and foremost. And we've had to do that because we're in areas, like in my nation, where we used to have thousands and thousands and thousands of caribou, an animal that we subsist on, and an animal that is protected under treaty. 
As of 2011, when we finalized the caribou report, we now have between 176 and 276 caribou within our traditional hunting territory. Chief Gordon Plains from the Tsuk Nation in British Columbia said, there is an appetite for change, and I really believe that the next generation is the one that is going to make positive changes. And as long as we continue to raise beautiful children like that beautiful young lady that hung around with me today, um, I think we're going to be all right. Um, the Creator provided the resources for us to take care of ourselves, and we're doing that a lot, is what he said. I see huge opportunity for all of us, and I encourage, encourage others to get in the canoe with us to build a stronger, sustainable economy that all of us can prosper together in. Um, so it's time. It's time to divest from this unstable economy that leaves our men and women scrambling. Stranded assets versus responsible investment, because while oil and gas investors are placing all of their eggs in one basket, relying on a dying economy, we continue to embrace the opportunity to be the change, because we are the change. It's time to bank on Kisagao Pisim, the sun, coming out every day versus scarcity of a non-renewable resources. Our people have always advocated and enforced this sacred element as the life giver. And we have an opportunity to change this disgusting system that commodifies our mother and capitalizes on her very being. And there's no need for us to be invasive of our mother. Every source of energy we need is outside of her. Do we need oil? Absolutely we do. I drive a truck, a really big one, from northern Alberta. But that's not what this is about, like I said earlier. This is our gift. And, and we have leaders that are gone now, like Big Bear, who was a, a signatory to Treaty 6, but resisted the signing of Treaty 6 because he foretold the future. And there's an oral history story that comes down through the lines that talks about Big Bear when he said, in the literal translation from Cree into English, was, and this was a time when we still tied our horses to the camp to keep them from straying with a noose around their neck. He said, I and my people will not be led around with a noose around our neck. And for some reason, you know, when I, I thought about um, late Peter Weggy last night, I thought about Big Bear. In not comparing the two, because there's no comparison, um, but I thought about that because I thought about how he, he, he's such a fo he was a forward thinker, a, a brilliant man, and one of those gifted with looking forward and then addressing in the current. Um, and I can't complete this lecture without acknowledging this man's use of the word economicology. Um, the interconnectedness of environment and economics not separating, but creating spaces and conversation of inclusiveness. Understanding that this isn't about pitting ourselves against each other, but instead addressing the systemic issues and participating in change. I promise this is my last page. Um, so making it, he made it really easy for me to talk about us collectively moving forward into a system based on the principles of people's participation gender equality, environmental and social justice, self-reliant and sustainable management systems while maintaining natural law, respecting Mother Earth, and that includes viable solutions as opposed to false solutions to climate change. And so as First Nations people, you know, we need conditions in our communities that support healthy and safe children and addresses the chronic systemic issues the trajectory of pain First Nations experience is systemic. So we're not only dealing with what's happening in our natural environment, we're dealing with systemic issues that are creating sick people with dysfunction and dependency. The issues our people face are far greater than a failing dollar and the price of a barrel. That there is only one of the catapults that set off the toxic bomb of poor and failing mental health, exacerbating drug and alcohol abuse, suicides, and every other ugly thing that keeps us living in a reactionary state. In my community alone, in one year, 
My ban list is about 1,200. We only have about 400 people living in the Indian reservation. And I lived there for three and a half years until I was forced off the reserve because of the chronic housing shortage in my community. Me and my children lived in a 900 square foot house with seven other people. We shared a bed and a bedroom. And I just moved out a year ago. And within that year in my community, in that year in my community, we have had five suicides. Young people feeling hopeless, taking their lives. That's a reality for my people. So if we want, if the government wants to talk about practicing reconciliation. They can ensure that we're adequately, adequately funded and that there are supports that promote community-based monitoring programs to address the health concerns of our people and that the just transition is inclusive to First Nations people with resources to prepare our people for a green economy rather than keeping us in a chronic system of underfunding, leaving us riding the coattails of industry. And the Beaver Lake Cree is one of those nations who, in turn, is responding by exercising their right to self-determination and demanding and asserting that we all need green economies defined by the people for the people. And so I'm going to leave you with this. Those are my children, um, Grace, Guy, and Gina. And it comes from the Lakota people. Honor those who came before us meeting the needs of the present generations, not compromising the future, so that the coming generations are able to meet their own needs and guide our vision and renew each cycle of life. Wow, I'm thankful and grateful to each and every one of you, all my relations. And I went way over time, I'm sorry. I think we're gonna open it for questions real quick. If you have a question, feel free to step down to the mic. Otherwise, if you raise your hand, we have a mic moving through the audience that'll come to you. Oh, and there's literature at the front door for the Beaver Lake Cree if you wanna pick it up at the very front door. And for those of you that have heard about the Leap Manifesto, um, there's copies of, of that as well at the front. I was one of the authors of that. No questions? Um, is there any more hope with yeah. Prime Minister Trudeau? Huh. <laughs> is there any additional hope with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau in his administration? <sighs> Why? Why? Um, you know, I want to remain optimistic and I want to be positive. But at the same time, we're continuing to see the same system being repeated at this point. We're seeing a lot of lip service. We're hearing a lot of these, you know, even Notley, the premier in Alberta, um, along with Trudeau, talking about, you know, Canada is back. Um, at this point, Canada is back to its old ways. Um, they're creating um, climate policies that are not actually... Um, inclusive to indigenous peoples. They're not actually following, you know, a proper level of, of consent and consultation from indigenous peoples. They're basically following that same old system of manufactured consent where they make the decisions and then they come to the indigenous people and they're like, look at this great idea. And, and so check, we've consulted. Um, and so at this point, as much as I want to be optimistic and as much as I was optimistic um, that hope is waning really fast, especially now with the conversation coming out of Alberta and British Columbia this morning around Notley and Christy Clark talking about an exchange for Site C Dam and the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Um, 
and Trudeau talking about um, you know, his, his work on the pipelines as well and how they want to use revenue from the pipelines to fund the work on climate. Huh? <laughs> Going back to 37% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions come out of Alberta, how? Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I want it to be positive, but... No? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even give an update, did I? Um, so actually, the Beaver Lake Cree at this point is scrambling to raise the money that we need um, to finish up the research and all of the documents that are, is needed in order to bring the case to trial. So if we had the money, we probably would have already had a trial date set. Um, but because we, we haven't gotten to that point yet, um, but you know, we're, we're getting more support and we're gaining um, steam on the, on the, the research that's needed. Um, we were actually about two years behind and I just heard the other day um, after Alberta um, again put up some more red tape and, and asked about 80 questions in response to our amended claim, which is up on our website, the tarsanstrial.ca. If you go there, it will reroute you to raventrust.com, which is the organization that, that holds all of the money for Beaver Lake Cree's litigation. Any money that's earmarked for Beaver Lake Cree's litigation, they hold it in a trust for us um, to make sure that it doesn't get mixed up with our, with our other money. Um, and they have 501c3 status too, I believe. They do, they do. It's not I believe, they do. Um, and so, um, right now, between Raven Trust and myself, we're just really trying to fundraise the money. But I just found out the other day after um, Beaver Lake went to court again, um, and we won again. We have yet to lose uh, a day in court. Um, that's another really great thing. Um, is that we are now, we were looking at like 2019 for trial. We're now looking at the end of 2017 based on whether or not though that we, we raise the money that we need to get to trial. So that's, that's really, that was really promising. I was like, good. <laughs> it's like less two years of me hitting the ground really hard. <laughs> How much money do you need? Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's the thing, right? Is it's a really expensive case. Um, we're it's about we're paying about two million dollars a year to hold the case. Um, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, that's wrong. That was the old numbers before we switched. Um, it's going to take us about two million dollars to get to trial, um, and we're about I want to say halfway there, maybe a little over halfway there. <laughs> right? Um, Canadian, unfortunately. Um, but again, in response to that, um, it sounds like a lot of money. I just want to say that, you know, in, in 2013, November 1st of 2013, um, we needed money for the Lynx report, um, which was very similar to the Caribou report, which got us to trial. Um, we needed to have the Lynx report completed. We needed $30,000 for this report. We didn't have that. We had a school whose doors were ready to be closed. Um, so where do we put the money, right? And so I had a keynote alongside Maude Barlow, Council, Council of Canadians, and, and David Suzuki. So we had a keynote together. And so what I did was um, I created a quick two-minute video, much like the one that you saw. And I wrote a blog, and I titled it, For the Price of a Movie Ticket, You Can Help um, a Community of 900 Take on the, the Largest Industrial Project in the World. We launched, I launched that on November 1st of 2013, and by November 21st of that same month, we had raised $33,000, and a lot of those people that donated, donated like $5. So, you know, to those people that have made comments to me about, you know, bake sales and, and fundraisers and screenings of This Changes Everything, where they, they, they do fundraisers, um, that said, you know, that's chicken change. Well, that chicken change paid for one of our projects and gave us more to carry forward into, into more research. So every little bit counts. So be, beyond money, how can we get involved? How can we as Mich Michiganders help um, on our end? I think the biggest thing here is, you know, um, is you folks are, are pretty organized. Um, but I think what I've seen is a large disconnect 
between um, the non-Indigenous communities and the frontline communities and you know, those that are not. Um, I you know, felt that disconnect as I was coming along. And so I feel like everybody is doing a part. Everybody is, is participating. And I think that if we want to talk about solidarity, then we really need to start exercising that. Um, and so I think further to that is the education on what's happening on both sides of these pipelines. And there's tons of resources out there, um, hosting screenings of this changes everything, um, sharing the website. Um, we have a PDF printable version of the lawsuit on the website. Um, you know, so we've done things like that to make it easier. Um, Recycling, like I told the kids today, you know, you guys have a compost here, use it. Um, you know, very simple, fundamental um, knowledge, common sense. Um, as long as we are um, up here, <laughs> as long as we are um, using oil, are we not supporting the tar sands and all the big companies? Um, in their endeavors, and so how do we um, um, negotiate that issue? You can't. You can't negotiate it. Um, like I said earlier, uh, I'm not, we're not saying no to oil, but we are saying that, why don't we go straight to the source? Fossil fuels is basically thousands and thousands and thousands of years of the sun. So in part by investing, you know, divesting from dirty oil and investing in renewable energy, you know, going directly to the source, that's, that's a part of it. Um, we're never going to completely get away from it. And we recognize that, but we can start to lessen our dependency on it. Uh, four years ago, I <clears throat> wrote a letter to the editor of the Grand Rapids Press making a connection between en en Enron Line Number 5 mm -hmm. and the Kalamazoo Valley spill. And they sent me back a reply, check your facts. Well, that was four years ago. Now, since then, we've discovered that, yes, that same sludge that was spilled in the Kalamazoo Valley area was coming through that line. Mm -hmm. And... And now we're being told by the company that they've cleaned up the Kalamazoo Valley area. Truth of the matter is, and I've, I've got sources for that, they have not cleaned it up. They don't know how to clean it up. And <clears throat> if I can connect my thoughts here, uh, <clears throat> we haven't made the connection today strong enough between what happened there and in Flint. Okay, the same state of Michigan that fined that company, let them get away with $20 million for not cleaning up the Kalamazoo mm -hmm. Valley watershed area, has done this thing to Flint. And they're the ones that are in charge of what's going on with our environment here. We've got to make some, we've got to wake up and make some big connections and make changes uh, because you're suffering, people of Flint are suffering, potentially we are suffering. Mm -hmm. And we've got to protect ourselves and our children. Thank you for your message today. Thank you. Okay. That's it? All right. Oh, one more question. I can hear you. So her question was, do the Beaver Lake Cree work with other communities across Canada? We work with other communities across the world. Um, we, are, we do our best to exercise self-determination and sovereignty and solidarity. So yes, absolutely, um, the, the nations are connected along um, these routes, um, along these, uh, in, in relation to these issues. Um, and you know the foundation that a lot of the nations are taking 
are you know, utilizing the rights of Indigenous people. So even if it's nations that may be in support of um, industry, they still put Indigenous rights first, uh, first and foremost. I am the treaty coordinator and communications manager for the industry relations for my community. You know, I'm not an adversary. A lot of people call me an adversary. A lot of people call me um, an activist. I'm neither of those things. I'm a mother. And at the same time, um, my community, because of these systems of manufactured consent, and it's the same across the board, um, we have no choice. The projects are going to happen with or without, but silence is consent. Um, so we just do our best within these six systems of like things like impact benefit agreements. Um, we do our best to participate in them until you know we're able to win cases like the Beaver Lake Cree, which is based on self determination, like letting us determine what it looks like. And there's a lot of other nations like that, so there's a lot of connection. Yeah. I think that I think we're officially wrapping up, yeah. but thank you so much for coming out here and sharing your stories. I know this week has been a long journey, um, and we appreciate it so much. Um, but just so that everyone in the audience can know, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Where should we go? Should we go to the website if we want to continue the conversation? So I don't. Do you guys take like an email list or anything? That's a good question. So the best thing so can, at this point, because I do not have like enough that. cards to give yeah. out, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> um, is you can go to thetarsanstrial.ca, mm -hmm. which reroutes you to Raven Trust. So if you forget that title, you can go to raventrust.com, and um, that will, um, you can click on the Beaver Lake Crease tab. So if you emailed Raven Trust, and told them you want to get a hold of me, they'll they have direct access to me. Um, the other option is my email address is my last name Layman mm -hmm. at ualberta.ca. Okay. And we will have information. Okay. On the foundation yeah, I was going to say maybe through the foundation we can facilitate yeah, I, I can give my as well. Email I wasn't exactly sure, but okay, sounds good. So we'll put it on the the Weggy Foundation's website. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>